Okay. So, topic in 9 and 19 is electrochemistry. And we're going to do it in a little bit or different order than we did um, in class, just kind of mix things up and to um, make sure that um, we're looking at stuff and kind of help you um, remember some things. But the first thing that we're going to have to do for this is definitely the definitions of oxidation and reduction. So the IB establishes three different definitions of oxidation and reduction, and each of them kind of serve their purpose. Um, but again, it's kind of the IB showing the evolution of the definition, how science has um, kind of broadened the inclusion of species that are included in oxidation and reduction. So there is a best definition, but... The other definitions are kind of to um, help you understand that there were other previous definitions, kind of like the way Arrhenius, Bronsted, Lowry, and Lewis worked. These um, work kind of a similar way. Okay. So the key thing is, and this is every single question that talks about this, is they'll say in terms of. So... Whenever you have a question like this, they will specify in terms of which definition, and then you'll have to make sure you reference that definition. Because if you use the wrong definition, then you won't get credit for it. Because they're very specific. Again, the IB doesn't doesn't um, doesn't kind of mince words. They're very deliberate about what they want you to say, and it's pretty straightforward. And so, you've got the first one is in terms of. Electron transfer, and I will write this up here as oxidation, and I'll write this up here as reduction. Okay. the 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 first definition that was kind of arrived at was electron transfer, and with this, you were looking at kind of simple half reactions where you gain or lose electrons, and so you would see something like Oops. The oxidation would be loss of electrons, whereas reduction would be gain of electrons. And the kind of issue here is you had to have charges on species to be able to recognize that. And so, like, you would have to see something like this, Mg to Mg2+, plus, to recognize oxidation, or you'd have to see something like Cl minus to Cl2, I'm sorry, backwards, Cl2 to 2Cl minus to show that reduction in terms of that. And so whenever you had full complete reactions, it was difficult to kind of identify using electron transfer. But if you're looking at half reactions, things like that, it should be fairly obvious because you're looking at where the electrons are located in the half reactions. The next evolution here was change in oxygen or hydrogen. <coughs> and so with this, now you could look at a species that did the species gain oxygens or did it lose oxygens? Did it gain hydrogens or lose hydrogens? And so the idea is oxygen is very, very electronegative. So whenever it bonds with something, it will pull the electrons away from that species. So when you increase the number of oxygens, you actually lose the ownership of electrons in here. And so you would say... gain oxygen, so something like this, you would notice that the iron is gaining oxygens. And so therefore, you would consider that um, oxidation. And you could also say it as lose hydrogens, because hydrogens are um, <coughs> excuse me um, are also in a lot of different species that can cause this to change as well. I'm trying to think of what's the best way to what best reaction to show this. 
Um, I can't think of one that would do this. Oh. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Is that what I want? Yeah, I guess you can do this. Okay. So you would argue that, <coughs> well, no, I don't like that. I don't like that reaction because CL is not oxidizing here. Mm. Let me think about that for um, a little bit about definition. But the idea is if you're losing hydrogens, then it would also possibly be considered um, oxidation. If you lose oxygens, then it's reduction because um, when you're getting rid of those um, oxygens, the species regains ownership of those electrons. Okay. And so something like even, let's see, what would I do here? Um, okay. Something like this. I'm not going to balance a whole half reaction, but something like this where you're losing oxygens, you're reducing. Even though the charge of it doesn't look like it's reducing, that's where electron transfer can be kind of tricky. The CR within that, ion of two minus is losing at oxygens and so therefore it would be reducing and you could also say gain hydrogens as well so i think it's best to think of it in terms of oxygen and then just remember that hydrogen is the opposite so when something oxidizes it's gaining oxygen like when rust if you think about something real world application when you think about rust iron is rusting it's oxidizing because it's gaining oxygen from the air. And so that's the definition of that. Oops. Is it good? Yeah. For the example that you uh, put for uh, oxygen, would it be oxidation because of the electron transfer? Well, see, that's where that definition doesn't work. So, like, this is kind of where we have issues with each of the definitions. And so, like, it looks like that. But in reality, it's not. And that's why the electron transfer definition became outdated. Does that make sense? Because that 2 minus isn't the, the, the number of the chromium. It's the number of the whole ion. So it's deceptive um, in that. And that's why electron transfer isn't the ideal definition because there are issues with that. Just like you said here, it looks like it's oxidation. But in reality, the CR is actually plus 6, which we'll talk about in a second. That's a good point. The best definition, the most inclusive definition, is this one. The change in oxidation number. This always works. So if you're calculating oxidation number, this will always work to identify what's oxidizing and what's reducing in this reaction. So unlike electron transfer and change in oxygen hydrogen where it can be confusing or misleading, the change in oxidation number is a foolproof. But you have to know all these definitions because the IB has a tendency to ask you about like which definition wouldn't work in this scenario, which definition is not applicable, and which definition could you use in this work. And so I've seen those questions before in the IB exam, so it's important that you know all three of these definitions because you may have to speak on them and why they're invalid. Kind of like what Luthio was asking earlier um, about the um, CR207. You could talk about why um, one definition is invalid versus the other. Okay, change in oxidation number. For oxidation, okay, it is increasing. Okay, so the oxidation number within the species is increasing. So if we use the same idea of Fe plus O2 yields FeO, the idea now 
is that Fe is zero here because it's by itself, and then Fe is plus two, and that's increasing. So you couldn't use electron transfer here necessarily because you don't have any charges on any species and stuff like that. You could use the oxygen definition, but you could best use the change in oxidation number definition here. And here, it's decreasing. Okay, so if we use the Cr2 O7 2 minus going to Cr3 plus, chromium here is plus 3 because if you have an ion by itself, its charge is its oxidation number. But if you look at this, it's actually plus 6 because O is minus 2 and there's, four, there's 14 negatives because there's 7 oxygens. And therefore, each chromium has to be plus 6 so that it generates a 2 minus overall charge. So when you dig actually into the species, the chromium is changing from plus 6 to plus 3. And that's why this definition is the most inclusive of these definitions. questions about that okay now I'm gonna change things up a little bit because I know if you look in your notes we kind of go into oxidation number calculations but I'm gonna focus on I think what seems to be our bigger weakness and that's voltaic and electrolytic cells and talking about them and being able to do them because elect voltaic cells for us and electrolytic cells are pretty much just using electron transfers definition. So you're using very simple half reactions. You don't have to worry about oxidation number because you're just changing the charge of a species in here. And so it's less important that you understand oxidation number for this. And so I want to focus on this first, and then we can talk about balancing half reactions and combining reactions in a, um, in a more complicated way later on. But so the first lesson here, okay, is the voltaic cell. <clears throat> okay. And the voltaic cell converts energy from a spontaneous exothermic chemical process into electrical energy. So the idea is that we can harness the movement of electrons in these reactions where there occurs an oxidation and there occurs a reduction that happens naturally, spontaneously, I should say. And we can harness those electric, that electrical current that's passing through the wire in the scenario. Now, the kind of generic um, voltaic cell has two chambers, okay? And these are kind of half cells. And so within each of these half cells, you have electrodes. Okay. So within these half cells, you have electrodes. Let me label those. And in these half cells, there are solutions, which we call electrolytes. Now, if we're trying to maximize the cell, the, the charge and the current, we tend to keep these electrodes separate into separate cells. So that way, the only movement of electrons can happen is through the wire at the top from the anode to the cathode. 
Now, there was a um, – actually, we'll finish this, and then we'll talk about the, the lemon thing. Okay. You connect a wire. Oops. Between this and we have a voltmeter. That reads the value. Now, for SL, you don't really care what that voltmeter reads as long as it's positive, to be honest with you. Like, you don't care. In HL, you will have to calculate that. And we'll talk about that in the HL section of this lesson. Um, we'll call the electrons flowing this way. Okay, so the electrons are flowing from the left cell to the right cell. And what that tells you is that this cell undergoes oxidation, and it is the anode. And the right cell is reduction and the cathode. <clears throat> So that electron flow, that just that simple arrow of showing the electrons moving from left to right, tells you all you need to know about which one's the anode, which one's the cathode. Okay. Now let's do an example here. And I will say, um, we'll say for our reduction reaction, we'll have silver Ag plus going to Ag. And our oxidation is Cu2 plus, oh, actually, well, I should write the right way. Cu yielding Cu2 plus plus two electrons. Okay. If this is the case, then if you know these, you can label the rest of the diagram as such. You can label that this will be copper, and this will be some copper two plus solution, probably something like Actually, probably copper sulfate, to be honest with you. Because sulfate doesn't generally react that much, and so you might have something like copper sulfate in here. And then over here, you'd have silver, and you'd have probably silver nitrate here because silver sulfate precipitates. So you have Ag plus floating around here with NO3 minus. Now, the movement of the species is kind of the opposite of the movement of the electrons, right? Because what's happening here on the anode is the copper is going into solution. So it is oxidizing by losing its electrons and becoming Cu2+. But those electrons travel up the wire and they travel to the cathode. So when you're marking this, you're going to have a negative charge here because there is an abundance of electrons at that point. But electrons always flow from um, toward the positive. And so what happens here is the silver is plating, is reducing on top of this electrode here. So it is plating there. So that positive charge draws the electrons across to the cathode. And so the anode's negative, the cathode is positive. Kind of like your car battery. If you ever notice about your car battery, the, uh, 
the cathode is going to be the kind of red cover and the anode is going to be the, um, the negative black cover. That color system is kind of universal. And this is why I always do the cathode in red and the anode in black, if you didn't know that already. That's a very universal color um, method. So the problem is, though, if this is happening, then your solutions are becoming kind of oppositely charged, where the anode is becoming highly dense in Cu2+, and the cathode is becoming highly dense in NO3-. And you don't want that because once you get that high concentration of that, then that's going to um, impede the movement of electrons across that wire. And so you need something that will connect the two cells to allow it to kind of balance the charge in the solution so that the electron um, flow can still occur. Okay. Let me make a note up here. So from anode to cathode, electron flow from anode to cathode. Okay. So this... is our salt bridge, okay? Our salt bridge allows an ionic salt that's soluble in water to split up and then move in each direction to kind of balance out the, um, the charge that's in there. So very common one is KNO3, potassium nitrate, because neither of those species are gonna really react, and so they're safe to kind of use in a salt bridge. But so on the left, there's a positive charge built up of the Cu2 plus. So what you'll see is you'll see the NO3 minus go this direction to attract the Cu2 plus to the salt bridge. Okay. And on this side, you'll see the K plus attract the NO3 minus to the salt bridge. And that's what allows the, um, actually, you know, let me draw this arrow this way. Um, because I, I think they like to write show the movement of electrons as well. So the ions, I'm sorry. So the Cu2 plus and the NO3 minus are moving up toward the salt bridge to balance out the charges of this electrolytes so that the electron flow can still happen. Okay. Of the salt bridge, yeah, sure. The salt bridge is used to balance the charges in both half cells. Excuse me. So here's the thing. You also need to be able to balance these equations as well. And you may have to write an overall equation for this. And so when you write an overall equation for this, you have to make sure the electrons are canceled out. You shouldn't have any electrons in an overall equation. So what you have to do is you have to multiply this reaction by 2. So now you have Cu to Cu2 plus plus two electrons. And then two Ag plus plus two electrons yields two Ag. Now the electrons cancel. And your overall reaction is two Ag plus plus Cu yields Cu2 plus plus two Ag. And this is something I think on the mock exam, the IB did. The IB gave you the overall reaction, and you have to identify what's happening in that voltaic cell, HL and SL alike. And it's important that you identify what's oxidizing and what's reducing by looking at its oxidation numbers. So AG is going from plus to zero, and Cu is going from Cu2 plus, I mean Cu to Cu2 plus. And so that would be the anode, and the AG would be the cathode. So identifying these and labeling them correctly is a really important skill to have.
questions about this? Okay. Now, with the lemon, if you looked at if you look at a previous exam, there was a voltaic cell with a lemon where they stuck two electrodes into a lemon. <clears throat> excuse me, to create a voltaic cell. Now, you don't have to have two separate half cells for a voltaic cell to occur. You just have to have the, the electrodes in an electrolyte. And so essentially, the lemon juice that's in the lemon acts as the electrolyte, which allows the movement of electrons um, in there as well. So you could theoretically stick two electrodes into a lemon or any citrus juice, citrus fruit, to generate some kind of charge. Um, you could stick like a copper and a, a silver um, electrode in there, and then you could measure that charge. It's not ideal because since you're not separating them apart, um, the reaction um, doesn't work as efficiently, but it does generate a charge. And so um, that's what the idea with the lemon is. Yes, I know it's not two half cells, but all you really need is an electrolyte. All you really need is um, something that conducts electricity to complete the cell. And if it's all in one lemon, then you don't need a salt bridge anymore because the, the lemon juice itself is kind of um, moving the electrons left and right. I would say the lemon would probably um, reach equilibrium much faster than these half cells would. And that's why it's not like a common thing. That's why you don't see a lot of people using lemons for batteries. So, But it is um, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical sense, it does technically work. Oops, not voltaic. Sorry, we just did voltaic. Electrolytic cell. Okay. <clears throat> Converts electrical energy into chemical energy. by a non-spontaneous process. Okay. So with this, we're actually providing energy to force a chemical reaction to occur that doesn't occur naturally. So you're kind of fighting against spontaneity in these kind of systems where you're forcing something to reduce that doesn't want to reduce by putting in a bunch of energy to force it to do that. So with these, generally what you have is one cell. Oh, that's weird. And you'll have You'll have your two electrodes just like you did before. And so you still have your electrodes. Okay. You still have your electrolyte. Okay. So that conductive solution for SL that is only molten ionic salts, meaning that you will only deal with ionic salts that have been melted down so that they're free moving ions. So what's good about that is you don't have any um, choices to make. You really can only do the reaction one direction. And so that's, it's fairly straightforward. With HL, you also have to include aqueous solutions, which means now you have water competing against the salt for the chance at oxidation and reduction. So competing with that, you're going to have to use cell potentials and things like that. And we'll talk about that later on in the HL portion about how that works. Okay. 
But for right now, we're going to talk about molten ionic salts. Okay. And the idea with molten ionic salts is you have free moving ions. Which allow electricity to be conducted within the cell. And so what we do is we put a power source up here. And what we do is we essentially provide enough power to overcome the resistance of the reaction from occurring. And so when you provide enough power for that to do that, then the, the reduction in oxidations will occur. And so let's say we have something like, I don't know, K plus and Cl minus as our um, molten ionic salt. So KCl. Now, the purpose of an electrolytic cell for these molten ionic salts is to create their elemental um, form. And so essentially what you're going to see here is K plus going to K and Cl minus going to Cl2. So the main idea with this I, th I want you to focus on is that for molten ionic salts, you're trying to make the elemental form. You're trying to make the ions back into their elements because that will tell you which one is which here. Okay. Now the electrons still flow from anode to cathode. So we're still going to call this our anode and we're still going to call this our cathode because of the electron flow from this power source. Now, the idea here is that chloride, the Cl minus ion, is going to want to oxidize. So that chloride is going to need to gravitate toward this electrode. And the, the potassium is going to want to reduce. So it's going to have to gravitate toward this one. But like we said before, it's not naturally doing that. And so we have to make the electrodes a such, such that they will attract those species to the correct electrodes. This is why the charges of the electrodes are opposite of voltaic cell because this is not happening spontaneously. You have to force the Cl minus and force the K plus to go to the electrodes. And so when you look at this, Cl minus going to the anode, you would need this anode to be positive to attract the Cl minus. And you'd want this one to be negative to attract the K plus. So that's why the charge is kind of opposite here. So the electron flow will kind of also go through here as well. So remember, to have a circuit, you need a complete kind of uh, movement here. And so the electrons will flow through the electrolyte as well. Just like in a voltaic cell, the electrons flow all the way through. And you need to know the movement of the ions as well. questions on that. Okay. That is essentially um, everything you need to know about voltaic and electrolytic cells. And so what we'll do now is we'll talk about Um, balancing equations, okay? And within balancing equations, we can also talk about oxidation numbers and calculations as well. And so this next section is 
is labeled balancing redox half reactions. I think today's lesson might be a little bit more SL heavy than HL, but we'll see. Okay. So the idea here is we are going to be doing mostly acidic half reactions. And so we're going to have something like this with a four step process. And that four step process, you need to make sure that you review and revise because not every reaction will have all four steps needed. And so sometimes when you do too much practice, you end up not using one step a lot and you forget about it. And so you do want to make sure that you are um, following through to make sure everything else is balanced and things like that. But the first step balance non H's and O's. And so, oh, yeah, so in this case, it's chromium is not balanced before we go further. And so we have to add a two into that chromium here. And this is the, that's the step that I was saying that isn't always used. And so students, when they do a lot of practice, sometimes they forget about that step because a lot of times they don't end up using that step. Two. Balance O with H2O. So here we're looking at making sure that the auctions are balanced on both sides um, with waters. Now, it is a net difference in auctions. In this case, it's 7 to 0, so it's easy because you just add 7 waters. But if there were 7 O's and then 4 O's, you'd only add 3 waters. So be careful and look at both sides to see whatever net difference of auctions there is to make sure you add the right number of waters. Then you balance H with H plus. So again, look at the net hydrogens in both cases. There's 14 on the right, there's zero on the left. So therefore that is 14 H plus on this side. And last but not least, you have to balance charges with high, um, charges with electrons. And this is the second place that students make mistakes about this. I think students, for the most part, don't have trouble balancing oxygens and hydrogens. It's this balancing charge with electrons that is difficult for some students because when you're doing it, you forget about coefficients. And coefficients are a big deal because if there's 14 H pluses, that's 14 plus charge, not just one plus. Or if there's two CR3 pluses, that's six plus of charge. And so when you look at this, it's 14 plus and two minus, and this is six plus and zero. This is 12 plus, and this is six plus. So to, to balance this out, you need to add six valence, six, sorry, six electrons to the left to lower the, the charge on the left to six plus. And again, it's always good to look over the number of each atom to make sure it's balanced in here, okay? Um, to make sure the CRs are balanced, the Os are balanced, and the Hs are balanced. 
I wonder about balancing char checking your balancing charge because if you made a mistake in there, you still might get equal values on there if you just recalculate the same way you did before. So I think it's really important to make sure you kind of look at your species and make sure they're all balanced before you move on because – the, yeah, the biggest mistake that I think students make is they forgot to balance the non-H's and O's. And the second biggest mistake is they count their charges incorrectly for this. Yes. I'm not sure if um, I wrote this down wrong during class, but in my example... Oh, so you've got to remember, though, because it's positive 6 to negative 2, that's actually 8 on the number line, right? Because when you kind of think of it like this, that gap is 8. Okay, thank you. No, that's a good question. That's, that's, um, that's a good question. Yeah, you want to think about it as not the absolute value difference, but the actual um, difference. Yeah, good question. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So then, once you have these half reactions, you may have to be expected to combine them. And so you might have something like six electrons plus... 14 H pluses plus Cr2 O7 2 minus yields 2 Cr3 plus plus 6, oh sorry, 7 H2O. And then you might have something like, I'm going to keep it simple here just for our purposes here, is you might have something like Cu, Cu2 plus plus 2 electrons. Okay. And when you balance this, you want to make sure that the electrons cancel out. So you need to multiply this by 3 so that the 6 electrons will be canceled out in your reaction here. So this ends up becoming 14H plus, oops, sorry, I'm going to keep a 4, plus Cr2O7 2 minus plus 3Cu yields 3Cu2 plus plus 2Cr3+, plus, plus 7H2O. And when you do this, your charges should still be balanced. So if, you, if they aren't balanced, and you made a mistake somewhere. Maybe you didn't multiply by the right thing, or maybe you copied down one of the species wrong from your previous reactions. Because if you notice here, the left is still 14+, plus and 2 minus, and it's 6+, plus and 6+. Plus. So they are both 12+, plus on each side, and so... That makes sense. Okay. Also, as a reminder, for if you forget how to balance equations, if you forget how to balance half reactions, there is one in the data booklet, this one exactly, in the data booklet. So if you forget, go to the data booklet, go to, where's my data booklet? Go to the data booklet and you'll see the Cr2 O7 2 minus plus 14 H plus plus 6 electrons yields 2 Cr3 plus plus 7 H2Os. And if you look at it, it's kind of in order about what you need to do. It's very kind of convenient that way because, right, you balance the Cr's first, then you add the waters, then you add the H pluses, and then you add the charge. And so if for some reason you draw a blank and you're like, I don't remember how to balance half reactions. Go to your data booklet and look at this reaction and go, okay, what do they do here? It, it, it makes sense, and this is a great way, kind of a cheat sheet way of um, 
being able to balance those reactions. And so again, use your data booklet to its maximum potential. There's so much information in there that you can use to your advantage. And um, I think that's really important. Okay. Now, obviously this won't help you for multiple choice, but for short answer, um, always kind of a very um, handy resource. Now, here's something else I'll say. If you're not sure that you added the right number of electrons, there's another way to check that as well, and that's solving for oxidation number. And solving for oxidation number is um, not too difficult. And with these, there are a couple of rules that you want to follow, where oxygen is, for the most part, minus 2 when it's bonded, except for peroxides. And so you can assume that with transition metals that it's going to be minus 2. So this is minus 2, and there's 7 of them. So that's minus 14, and so this has to equal minus 2, so this is minus, plus 12, which makes each of these plus 6. And each of these are plus 3. So you're going from plus 6 to plus 3 twice, which means you need 6 electrons on that side. So if you want to double check your, ch your electrons, then that is another way to do it, calculating the oxidation number of the species in this. Okay, And note, oxidation number is always plus 3. Sorry, let me clarify. When you write oxidation number, it should always be plus 3 in that order, whereas charge is 3 plus. So, like I said, the, the, the trick that I think about is whatever I'm talking about goes last in that. So when I say oxidation number, the number goes last. When I say charge, the positive or minus, the charge goes last. The IB will take off if you write it in the incorrect notation. Because there are two very different things. A charge is something that's actually occurring and that's actually given value, whereas a oxidation number a lot of times is more of a theoretical value, not an actual application value. But it helps us understand the movement of electrons in um, species. And so we do want to use oxidation numbers to understand what's oxidizing and what's reducing, but those values themselves are all kind of theoretical. questions about that. Okay. Let's talk activity series of metals. Okay. The activity series of metals ranks the reactivity of metals. And what you need to understand is that metals are want to oxidize. So therefore, when you're higher ranked in the activity series, that means you're a better oxidizer. which means a reaction will occur if you're higher than the metal that is bonded already. If you look at the data booklet, 
there is an activity series, a kind of qualitative one here, where you have the metals ranked, lithium being the best oxidizer, and then gold being the worst oxidizer. And so with this, what it's saying is lithium will displace any species from its compound no matter what, whereas gold will never do that. It's very unreactive. And so the way you want to think about it is this. If you see something like Fe plus AgNO3, and you're trying to figure out whether the reaction occurs or not, what you're really looking at is Fe versus Ag plus. And so you want to you want to ask yourself: Is iron a better oxidizer? Because if it is, it will force silver to take its electrons and then allow it to be bonded with it. So the question is, is iron a better oxidizer? And if you look here, iron is a better oxidizer than silver. Silver is actually pretty far down on this. So if the answer is yes, the reaction occurs. So you would get, they would probably take several answers because iron could be plus two or plus three. But you would get this reaction for this. So with reactivity of metals or activity series, you want to ask yourself, is the metal by itself a better oxidizer than the metal that's bonded already? Because that, that metal is already oxidized. And so the only way the metal by itself can displace it is if it's a better oxidizer and it forces the other metal to take its electrons. I know it sounds kind of like a weird personification of things, but I mean, this is kind of the energy states and stability of um, ions and things like that. And so um, that's really what you kind of want to think about when you're doing this. We'll tie this in also Oops. to the idea of oxidizing agent and reducing agent. And so what we need to understand is that because iron is oxidizing, It is your reducing agent because agent member means facilitator. So if you're oxidizing, you're forcing something else to reduce, which then means this is reducing, which means it's the oxidizing agent. And generally you do write the whole species here. Now, if it's written in ionic formation, ionic, um, ionic equation, then you could just write the Ag+, plus, but you would usually write AgNO3 as your oxidizing agent. Okay. Let me scroll. We'll leave that there. Last thing for SL. I mean, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll do HL. Redox titrations, including the Winkler method. So, the Winkler method is a type of redox titration. So again, you're not going to um, 
where was I going with this? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, you're probably not going to see both a redox titration and a Winkler method problem on there because they're pretty much the same. And so you're going to see either or with this. And again, this just like a just like a acid base titration, you're doing a mole to mole ratio here, right? Because even in a redox titration, your ratio between the species is what you care about because you want to figure out how many moles of each species that you need. Oh, sorry. So, for example, let's say we have something like this. MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5Fe2 plus yields Mn2 plus plus 4H2O plus 5Fe3 plus. Our balanced equation there. Now, all you care about, well, first of all, let's talk about what's oxidizing and what's reducing. Okay, so when you look at this, iron going from plus two to plus three. So we would say it's oxidizing. Now H is staying plus one, oxygen is staying minus two. So by process of elimination, Mn has to be reducing. And when you calculate the oxidation number of Mn in MnO4, you find that it's plus seven. So it is reducing in this case. And when you do a titration, just like you do with acid and base, these are the only two species you care about. So that mole to mole ratio is what you would use to be able to calculate your unknown concentration of a substance. And so what you care about is that one mole of MnO4 minus requires five moles of Fe2 plus. So that's all you care about. You don't actually care about the products. You want to, you're trying to react and neutralize the redox. You're trying to add enough. I think usually what you do is you add the permanganate into the iron. So you're adding the permanganate enough so that it reduces all of the unknown iron in there. And then you can know what the concentration of the unknown iron solution is. And just like that, the idea of the Winkler method is the Winkler method measures the biological oxygen demand. So how much like organic matter is in the water? that can be consumed by bacteria and stuff like that, that consumes some of the oxygen in the water. And so we do a redox titration to figure out how much oxygen is left in the water. And then we can deduce based versus comparing it to pure water, how much biological oxygen demand there is present. And so here, you want this mole to mole ratio. Okay, and so that mole to mole ratio is your Winkler method ratio of the thio. This is thiosulfate, and that's what we use to, in the long procedure of Winkler method, to measure how much oxygen there is. And so we can write one mole of O2 versus four moles of S2O3 is equal to molarity of O2 times the volume of O2, which is the volume of the water. 
So they won't say outright, this is the volume of the O2 solution. They'll just say the volume of water sample. That's that. And then on the bottom here, the molarity of S2O3 times the volume of S2O3. If you want to use that equation to simplify things, you can use that for all, actually you can use it for all titrations to be honest with you because the mole to mole ratio has to be the same. So if you want to use it for acid base titration, you want to use it for redox titration, you want to use it for Winkler method, it's all the same. Wait, yeah. Why is the volume of O2 in water sample? Oh yeah, because we're trying to measure how much O2 is in the water sample so not the actual volume O2. We're trying to figure out how much O2 is in the water sample. So the volume of water that they give us, a sample of water, that's how much we're measuring the O2 is in. Maybe I'm not explaining that well. Like for the Winkler method, what you do is you take a sample of water and you let it sit for five days and let it consume oxygen. And then after five days, you do a titration on that sample of water to see how much oxygen is left. Well... The oxygen is dissolved in the water. So you're trying to figure out the concentration of O2 in that sample of water. So the volume of your O2 is a sample of water that you are using for the titration. Okay, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And when you do this, you're going to get some molarity of O2 over decimeters cubed whatever that value is. But remember, we can't use molarity to calculate BOD. We have to convert it okay, um, into milligrams per decimeter cubed. And so we have to convert our moles of O2 to 32 grams of O2. And one gram of O2 is 1,000 milligrams of O2. And that will get us our parts per million, our PPM. And that PPM is the O2 remaining. So this, all these calculations were, were for you to calculate how much O2 was left in the water. So then what you do is you take pure water minus the remaining that you calculated. And that difference is the biological auction demand. I don't think I've seen this on the past couple of years of exams, so it might be t it might be, you might be due for it. Um, but I'm trying to think of how, because this is a lot of memorization. So I would be willing to bet that they would probably give you the Winkler method reactions, and and so that way, if you don't remember the mole to mole ratio, you could figure out kind of through the reactions what the mole to mole ratio is, like we did in class, and then. Maybe they'll say a milligram per decimeter cubed is a part per million. Because like, I feel like the IB is trying to go away from memorization and stuff like that and just make sure that you're executing things correctly. And so I'm just trying to think of how they would do that. Hmm. Okay. Questions? Okay, um, that is the end of the SL portion of the, um, the material.